Greetings programs and hello true believers, this is Martin and welcome back for video number two in our series on the Milwaukee case of the secret. Uh, this is your exclusive home for the one and only true solution to the secret here in Milwaukee. Uh, video number one, uh, that was your full on location walkthrough uh, of our solution. If you haven't seen that yet, please go see that first. Uh, that is going to give you information that you're not getting here and it's going to show you the actual uh, locations. And I ask, if you're going to watch these videos at all, please, please watch them all the way through. You are not going to be able to discern whether this is the correct solution or not by shutting it off halfway through the video when you see something you don't like. Or when you find out that I'm not doing a video on Lake Park and just completely ignoring me. No, if, if you really want to know what the solution is, then watch these videos all the way through and, and tell me I'm wrong, please. You know, I would love for people to challenge me. Challenge me. If you think this is wrong, don't just make these, you know, the, these kind of general statements about, oh, you know, I don't see how it fits and this doesn't seem right to me. And, oh, my Lake Park theory is so awesome. No, look, we're, we're talking about this solution. So if you think it's wrong, prove it. I think the evidence that we have here is irrefutable. I think these connections are uh, completely irreconcilable. I don't know how you can look at this and see how all the things connect and not see uh, that this is the correct solution. And I'm going to try my best not to monologue too much, uh, but there are a few things I want to say uh, before I go any further. Uh, there's a couple reasons why I wanted to do uh, video number two. Uh, the, the previous video was not only my first attempt at making a YouTube video, but it was my first attempt at uh, explaining and defending this solution to a relatively large audience. And I would say for all intents and purposes, we did a pretty decent job of that. Uh, but, you know, looking back, I do wish there were things I wish I had explained better, uh, things I wish I had sold you guys on better, maybe provided some additional context. But I really didn't think that was going to matter. Personally, I thought that once you had the meat and potatoes of the solve, of the evidence, that you guys would, would run away with it, that you would, you would see how things connect, and you would start to make your own conclusions. And I can't say I'm surprised by the reaction. Uh, I mean, you know, definitely a mixed bag in terms of reaction. I can't say that I'm surprised. I'm certainly disappointed. But what we're working against, we have all these preconceptions about what the solution has to be, where it has to be. You know, so many people are so focused on Lake Park. Uh, that is one of the primary things that we're battling against, is this preconception that it has to be Lake Park. And, and again, I'm not picking on any particular people. There's a lot of really intelligent people that think Lake Park is right, and they're just completely wrong. You have a lot of individual pieces of evidence. You know, if you ask somebody why they think it's at Lake Park, they'll point out a handful of different pieces of evidence, including the, uh, the, the, the staircase that supposedly has uh, 92 steps. It has 95 steps. I went there, I counted them myself multiple times. I don't know what kind of creative, cre creative accounting that we're doing in order to get 92 steps there. But, but this is what people at Lake Park have to do, is you know, they, they take the evidence and the information and they manipulate it to try to make it fit. I mean, ask yourselves, look, we have how many people over such a large period of time looking at this thing, we have like 47 different variations on the, uh, the Lake Park solution and nobody can figure it out? I mean, with all this focus and attention on Lake Park and people studying it for years, whereas the guys in Chicago, they, they figured it out like just like that in 83? I, I, I think that's a red flag to show that people are focusing on the wrong details and, and looking in the wrong location. Uh, but, you know, again, we're going back to all these uh, preconceptions. T t tell me something. So one thing I got called out for is you know, that the, the cask location is not in a park. Whoever said it has to be in a park? I want to know. That's something that seems like everybody believes. But where in the world did it come from? It didn't come from the book. Let me show you, read to you, what the book says about that. A quest for 12 treasures. Over $10,000 in precious jewels. They may be hidden in your city or your local park. They are differentiating between your city and your park. That could be part of why we have so many of these that haven't been solved yet, is people are focusing on the wrong details. They're trying to find a park and make it fit the, uh, the, the verse, 
and it's not working out that way. And that's part of why I found the solution in the first place is I didn't have any preconceptions. You know, I knew about Lake Park, but I didn't uh, look into it before I started uh, studying this thing. I came into it with, you know, with no bias, no preconceptions. All I wanted to do is find the right answer. And that's what I found here. And so many people are trying to uh, prove Lake Park instead of solving the secret. And that is part of the problem. And one more thing I want to mention, and then I'll actually get to the point. So for those of you who believe in Lake Park, this is what you're telling me. You're, you're telling me that in a city that is filled with historic landmarks and culturally rich neighborhoods, that Byron Priest would ignore all of that and instead focus his efforts on an affluent neighborhood, almost completely devoid of those things, and focus the first half of his verse exclusively on street names. As you walk the beating of the world is a street at a distance in time. No idea. Uh, from three who lived there, it's a street at a distance in space. No idea. From woman with harpsichord silently playing, one street. Th that's what you guys. That's what you think is the grand solution to this. That that doesn't. <laughs> that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. But I, I do plan on doing a separate video in the summer on Lake Park and kind of go over all the different things that people believe about it and all the various reasons why it's wrong. I mean, again, you're focusing on a couple of details and ignoring all the things that point you somewhere else. I mean, you look at the, uh, the painting. What is City Hall doing in that painting if it has anything to do with Lake Park? You do not need City Hall to identify that painting as belonging to Milwaukee. That's what the Rebus is for. See, anyone can read the Rebus and see it says Milwaukee. Not everyone's going to know that that's City Hall. And how can it be City Hall if you're, if you're north of City Hall and you can't see it? You're at a higher elevation, but the painting is showing the woman at the base of City Hall. So how is that woman the lion statue in the first place? I, I'm going to stop ranting. Let's actually get to uh, the solution here. I have a lot of new information for you guys today. So I knew even when I made the original video that I was missing some stuff. And uh, I was missing some fairly large things. And I, and I was. I, I found some additional, very significant pieces of evidence that point us to the same solution. Uh, some minor things as well uh, that are kind of supportive evidence. And so my sister is filming this right now, and she doesn't know that I actually figured out something new yesterday. And we are going to reveal this new piece of evidence, which is pretty significant, at the end of the video. So, let's get started. And we are going to start with the painting and uh, looking at the, the cloak of the woman and the owl. Now, in the previous video, we identified... Uh, the L as being your starting point and representing uh, Lincoln Avenue, which is that it does, it's true. But I felt like the the starting point should be more explicitly stated. There should be more information. Uh, then something occurred to me. So when you turn the L sideways, you see these trees, and of course, those that believe in Lake Park think that these trees uh, refer to birch trees in the park, which this is a misinterpretation of that. Now, if you remember uh, the uh, my monologue from the previous video. I was standing in front of trees at the starting point, and those trees had a very similar pattern and design to them. But that's not the compelling part. So you look at this, the image of the L and the image of the trees, those are perpendicular to one another, just like the intersection of a street. And there are four trees, because this is representing the intersection of 4th and Lincoln. And what do you find steps away from 4th and Lincoln from three stories of the Kunzelman Esser Furniture Building on historic Mitchell Street as viewed from the Lincoln Avenue overpass. So you have an image from the painting that is telling you the starting location, and you have the very first line of the verse steps away from that location. Somebody tell me how that's wrong. And not only that, but then it leads you to uh, like two or three more lines of the verse and another image from the painting. And that's the thing with this solution. It is leading you in a specific direction. You don't have to go randomly look for things that fit the, the verse. All right, so remember, this is a puzzle. This is actually leading you somewhere. There are pieces that fit together. So even if one piece might not be compelling to you, it's not always about the individual piece. It's about where, how you got there and where it's taking you. And remember also, we, uh, 
identified in the previous video that this painting is just as much a, a map as what you're creating by the verse. And you are literally at the same places at the same time uh, when you compare the painting to the actual map when you're deciphering the verses. All right, let's, let's keep going. So uh, view the three stories of Mitchell. That's pretty self-explanatory at this point. I don't think I need to reiterate that. Uh, as you walk, the beating of the world. Now, guys, pay attention to these words. He doesn't use these words by mistake. He uses words for very specific reasons. Uh, every word is a clue. And when you read this, as you walk, the beating of the world. Is this describing a street name or is this describing an experience? This sounds like something you're experiencing. Something He's using very visceral words here. Uh, it, it sounds like it's uh, something that you're feeling and that you're hearing, and that's what this location that we're already at uh, is, is it's what you're experiencing. The cars are beating the world beneath you, and we identified that before, and that makes sense. But uh, you, you can take that one further, and you can compare the highway system to the human circulatory system uh, in, in, in your body. Uh, just like the highway is taking cars to different places in the city so they can function and give the city overall life, your body's doing the same thing. Blood is being taken to the organs so they can function to give your body life. And when you compare it this way, the highway has a pulse or it beats as you walk the beating of the world. Uh, next, at a distance in time from three who live there. Now again, with the words, pay very close attention to at and from. We have two sets of at and from. So what this is doing, this is identifying a, a specific location you are at and then a more specific point at that location that, that you are leaving from to go to the next location. Makes perfect sense, right? So at a distance in time. So on this bridge, you are at a distance uh, from the four-face clocks. And from three who live there, you know, when you first read that, you think it's referring to uh, three, you know, different people or three different groups. But what it really means is three examples of the same group because you have three examples of the Polish culture all represented with the four-faced clocks on, on, those, uh, on those examples. You have the Polish moon, St. Stanislaus, and St. Josephat's. So, and we're already going west. There's really nothing telling us that we're going east, and we have further confirmation from the painting that you need to keep going west because you see the five in the crook of the woman's elbow uh, on the painting. So this is telling us to go past 5th Street and actually to follow the, uh, the, the clocks from uh, Alan Bradley, St. Stanislaus, down to St. Josephat's. And then when you get down to St. Josephat's, uh, you are almost exactly at Kosciusko Park. So then the, the next line of the verse, at a distance in space. So this is a very generic uh, statement that he's making, or it seems that way, because you, if you interpreted this just as a distance between two points, it could literally be anything, and that's kind of the genius behind this, is when he's referring to something very general and generic, he's actually making a much more uh, specific reference. That's why we shouldn't be interpreting, you know, rocks as rocks, and dirt as dirt, and trees as trees, you know? I mean, you keep all that. It, these are much more specific references that he's making. So... What this is saying, so at a distance in space, you are at a location that represents a distance between two points. And that's exactly what Kosciusko Park is. And if there's any question, read the inscription on the statue. The statue says, the hero of both hemispheres. He is connecting both hemispheres together. He is connecting America and Poland together. That is your distance between two points in space. Makes perfect sense. But then beyond that, we have other references to Kosciusko Park, both in the, the verse and the painting. So let's talk about From Woman with Harpsichord. So this is the specific location in the park compared to the general location of the park. And you're given multiple points of reference to verify that you're in the correct location. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense that this location is the Kosciusko statue. Uh, the puzzle is leading you straight down Lincoln Avenue, and at this point there's no indication that you're supposed to deviate uh, from that. Uh, and you're led right to the statue, uh, which is right off of the sidewalk. Uh, it's also the most prominent landmark in the park. The park is named after Kosciusko. It's another example of Polish culture. And our interpretation of at a distance in space is a reference to the inscription on the statue. 
Now, in the previous video, we identified the woman in the verse to be the same as the woman in the painting, which is a representation of General Kosciusko. Uh, for a full explanation of that, please see the previous video. Uh, but for additional context, uh, I want to bring up the Boston case of the secret, which is a confirmed solve. And in this case, Byron Priest disguised the Christopher Columbus statue as the woman in that painting, which is also the cover image. So although this doesn't prove anything per se, it further reinforces the idea that this is possible, that Byron had done this before, and we're certainly not setting any precedent here. Uh, and it's certainly no more ridiculous than the woman being a lion statue. Uh, and speaking of which, can anyone tell me what connects the lion statue to the woman other than Josh Gates's opinion? Uh, and also, here, here's another painting that we found of Kosciusko that shows the uh, uncanny similarities between the two. So the woman and the harpsichord are clearly uh, closely related, yet separate things, given the structure of the line. Uh, I suggested in the previous video that the harp lights are the harpsichord that's referenced in the verse. Uh, but based on new evidence, I have to backtrack on that. I no, no longer believe that. Uh, and here's why. The harp lights that are immediately around the statue were installed when it was refurbished in 2013. And while the harp lights on, on Lincoln Avenue appear to have been there prior to this, they're all up and down Lincoln Avenue, so they're not exclusively at the statue location. So it's really not a, an authentic representation of the language that's being used. So then, what is the harpsichord? Well, it just so happens that in 1777, General Kosciusko wrote a Polish dance scored for a harpsichord. So not only is this a solid harpsichord reference connected to Kosciusko, but it's also an additional example of Polish culture. And given how obscure a harpsichord is, there's only so many solid connections that you can make. Now in the Lake Park interpretation, from woman with harpsichord silently playing refers to Marietta Avenue. And it is true that Marietta Robusti painted a self-portrait of herself with a harpsichord. So in theory, that is a solid reference. But here's the problem. What's a reference to an Italian painter doing in a puzzle that focuses on the German culture? I mean, you can make arguments for the Polish culture being involved all day long, but how does an Italian reference, and only one of them, how does that fit? All right, so then let's look at silently playing. So, silence is the absence of sound, and the harpsichord, which makes sound, although referenced, is absent from the statue. And clearly this line is related to the previous one, but being a separate line, it also suggests that it's something separate as well. So, I still believe that this is a reference to the playground, and I recently got my hands on some historic aerial photos from the 80s of Kosciusko Park, I'm not going to show those just because of the, uh, the grainy nature of them. The quality isn't the best. But the, so the playground is visible, and it was not only closer to the statue, but it was more in line with it as well. So not only is this a, an additional reference to confirm you're in the right location, uh, but this could also be a landmark to lead you into the park, since the next line of the verse is step on nature, and you are on the edge of the park, and you have not stepped on nature yet. You still have to step, step on the grass and cut into the park. Now let's talk about Kosciusko Park for a minute because I, I have to make some uh, alterations to my uh, previous interpretations. Uh, there, there's a few things, I'll, I will gladly admit, there's a few things that I got wrong here that we need to correct. Uh, so after viewing the, uh, those aerial photos that I talked about, uh, I have to conclude that the pool is not referenced in the painting, given that at the time it had a more rectangular shape. So it was in the right location, but it had a, a completely different shape. Uh, and of course, as stated in the previous video, uh, this really doesn't change the validity of, validity of the solution. I honestly wish I hadn't included it, because it really didn't, didn't uh, add or take anything away, uh, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, and re in regard to the pond, you know, you can take it or leave it. Uh, it's another piece, uh, especially without the pool, that doesn't really change the solution either way. Uh, we did retrace the cloak to more accurately reflect the contours of the woman's cloak and isolated the jewel since that, in theory, is in a different location, uh, which this new version does look much more similar to the pond. Uh, and ironically, when I first started looking at this, 
you know, at a quick glance, that shape in the cloak looked like the pond to me. And I grew up over near Kosciuszko Park, so I was familiar with it. And then I saw the, the L in the cloak, and that immediately made, made me think of Lincoln Avenue and the neighborhood that the park is in, which is Lincoln Village. Uh, so this is part of why I even uh, looked at Kosciuszko Park in the first place. So, so it's ironic. But, you know, if you don't think the pond uh, is illustrated in the painting, then just disregard it and we can move on. Now, the key element to Kosciuszko Park, the one that is absolutely definitive, uh, is the red balls representing the boxing club. Uh, the red balls are one of the more compelling clues in the entire puzzle if you understand their purpose and their implications. Boxing gloves are round and red, and there's two of them, so they could certainly be compared to red balls. The woman is holding one of the balls, which indicates possession. It belongs to her, and it makes sense that the boxing club is in a park named after Kosciuszko, who we believe is the woman. But then the other ball is floating and leads to the objects of the rebus, which indicates you're supposed to follow the boxing club out of the park. The red balls lead you to the key and the walking stick in the painting. And in real life, the boxing club leads you to the key and the walking stick. And when you compare the geographic location of the boxing club on the map relative to the floating balls location in the painting, it's a close match. And I'll, I'll go over in a, a little bit uh, the, the, the most uh, kind of significant connection with the red balls and what tells us, I mean, it's, it's irreconcilable how this connects. I mean, the, the painting and the verse are taking you to the same place at the same time. But look at the hand of the woman and the silhouette that is created uh, with the uh, red ball floating above it. That silhouette looks an awful lot like a bell. And bells have an obvious connotation to boxing. And that silhouette is being created by the red ball. I mean, that, that's pretty obviously representing the, uh, the, the boxing club in the park. All right, and, and then let's, let's talk about the, the, the symbolism of the, the painting in uh, general uh, for a moment. Because I mentioned, like, City Hall before and how Lake Park doesn't really make sense in light of City Hall. You look at this. So the, the woman is standing at the foot of City Hall, which Kosciuszko Park is south of City Hall, so that makes sense. Uh, she is wearing a ragged cloak. And you just happen to be in a low-income neighborhood, so that makes sense. The, uh, she is looking toward the east, toward the jewel, and our cask location is to the east of Kosciuszko Park. And then you look at this cloak, too. It, it, it looks very similar to like a, like a religious cloak, like maybe like a, uh, like a Catholic robe or something like that. And you have all of these uh, different churches that are along the path. And, of course, we are right in the shadow of St. Josephat's in this park. And that's the next thing to look at here. So to the left of the woman, you see this blob. Uh, you know, I don't take anything for granted uh, in the painting or in the verse. I assume that everything has meaning. And when I saw this, I knew this had to be something. That's St. Josephat's, you guys. If you take this painting and superimpose it over a picture of St. Josephat's, I went to the Wikipedia page and found the thumbnail and put the painting over it. It's a perfect match. I mean, even the shading is correct. It's uncanny how perfect that is. And it's ironic, too, because the verse says, Step on nature cast in copper. That's an obvious reference to St. Josephat's. And it just so happens we have a shadowy image, image of St. Josephat's in the painting. And if you go down to the Kosciuszko statue and you stand on the, you know, the same... If you look at the statue from the same perspective that we're seeing the woman in the painting, you see the domes of St. Josephat's behind you. And you're, you're basically seeing the same amount of the image. Now, it's, uh, it's on the right side of the face, not on the left side of the face. But again, he reverses so many things. And uh, to have it uh, to the right of the woman's face would be in the way of everything else uh, and would kind of uh, put it front and center. And that's not what he's trying to do here. All right, so step on nature, cast in copper, we went over that pretty well. Okay, so ascend the 92 steps after climbing the Grand 200. So a few things to go over here. Now notice in the, the previous lines of the verse, these lines are uh, paired together pretty logically, right? View the three stories of Mitchell as you walk to the beginning of the world. 
at a distance in time from three who live there. So it makes perfect sense that we're, we're not reading this, uh, you know, ascend the 92 steps after climbing the Grand 200 past the compass. No, we're reading this as ascend the 92 steps after climbing the Grand 200. And it just so happens that when you uh, go north through the park after you've stepped on nature, you go straight north, you run into an obstruction. And that obstruction just happens to be a grandstand that had a 200 meter track to it. Grand 200. So at the very point where you need an obstruction, you have one and you have to climb over it because it's in your way. You know, it's, it's a, a, a figuratively climbing over, but when you talk about look, looking at things on the map and so much of this is based on map work, and that's the interesting thing too, Lake Park barely uses a map for anything. I mean, you really have to be, you know, there to figure this out. And in the book it even says you don't have to be there to figure it out. You can figure it out at home. So to me that indicates that he's relying a lot on, on the map. Now let's look at the painting again and the red ball. So we mentioned in the previous video that the boxing club lines up perfectly with 10th Street and the symbolism is showing you you have to follow the boxing club north, right? And in the painting the red balls are leading you to the key and the walking stick. And in real life, if you follow the boxing club north, uh, you get to Wind Lake and Forest Home. And those two streets match perfectly with the angles of the key and the walking stick. You are literally going the same place at the same time between the painting and real life. Tell me how that's wrong. How could that possibly be wrong? It is literally leading you. And then, the key and the walking stick make up the, uh, uh, the symbolic staircase of 92 steps. And again, you know, he doesn't say 92 stairs, he says 92 steps. Ascend the 92 steps. You're ascending them on the map. All right. So, uh, past the compass, you know, I, I think we covered that one pretty good in the, in the previous video. I mean, it makes perfect sense that it's the interchange in the highway. It's representing north, south, east, and west. It's, it's telling you that you've gone far enough that you properly counted the 92 steps because it's, it's, a, it's a little uh, subjective how you're counting those uh, steps on the map. But And ironically too, for you know those of you that believe in Lake Park and you think that the lighthouse is the compass, ironically, A, it doesn't represent the compass at all other than being called North Point, and B, it's not actually leading you anywhere that fulfills the, the lines of the verse. And yet our compass is doing that. Below the bridge, walk 100 paces, southeast over rock and soil. So let me point out how easy is it to find a location where you are going below a bridge, but then traveling over rock and soil. That's pretty difficult. That would be pretty difficult to do unless you're going under a bridge and traveling southeast over two streets that represent rock and soil, mineral and greenfield. Makes, makes perfect sense. So after you take 100 paces underneath the bridge, you know, if you were to, in a stair-step fashion, travel south and east, so the first chance you get, take your street south and then go east, and continue that in a stair-step fashion, because it does say travel southeast over rock and soil, that gets you exactly to Second and Scott, which is where we took you in the original video, uh, and uh, takes you to the first Young Birch. Now, I don't understand how anyone can interpret this line to mean you know, the birch trees. You know, on the one hand, we're saying that something that's nothing like a compass can be a compass because of the name, but on the other hand, we're saying that first young birch has to be a birch tree. That doesn't make any sense to me. And given that he says first young, how do you figure out which birch tree is first and young compared to the other? I mean, that's, that's so subjective to do that. And this is actually the first line that I started on. If I had tried to uh, start figuring this out from the beginning, I never would be where I am now. You know, my, my theoretical framework was if I could focus on the right line of the verse and find a very specific reference that that would get my foot in the door and then I could uh, reverse engineer everything else and figure everything else after. And that's why I figured out so much of the verse within an hour and a half after starting to look into this thing. So uh, everything from below the bridge 
to add its southern foot. I had all of that figured out in, in an hour and a half, and that's because the first young birch uh, led me there. Uh, and that is very obviously a reference to, well, I shouldn't say very obviously, it's a very obscure reference. Uh, and when I first figured out that, you know, it could be referring to Harry Lindy Bradley, you know, being first and young when he co-founded the Allen Bradley uh, Corporation and was also a founding member of the John Birch Society, I wasn't immediately uh, captivated by that piece of evidence. But I didn't ignore it. I saw where it, uh, where it would lead me. And that's when I found the, the, the bridge, which was our overpass. Uh, I found Mineral and Greenfield. Uh, I, I mean, 3rd Street is right there. You go west. You see the Proud Tall Fifth. I mean, it leads you to all of those things. Uh, and so in one of the Lake Park interpretations, they take past three staying west as going east past three trees, but staying west of the cliff. I mean, I find that absolutely ridiculous. But, you know, I, I get the logic in that, you know, staying west can either mean you're going west or continuing west, or it can mean you're staying west of something. But if you're saying staying west of something, what is that thing? Where is the painting in the verse telling you what that is? And how do you know what direction you're even going in? See, remember, we can't use our own ideas. We have to use the painting in the verse to uh, lead us there. And if you're, you're, you're taking... Uh, this alternate interpretation of that line, you have to fill in the pieces with your own ideas, and you're never going to get to the solution if you do that. All right, so you'll see a letter from the country of Wonderstone's Hearth. Uh, we covered that uh, on a proud tall fit. So I just I wanted to go over uh, reiterate this point too. So you know, being proud. It could be proud because it's a representat uh, representative of the German culture. It can also be proud because it's a bright red church immediately visible on the highway. It's right out, out in the open. So that's what would make it proud. Uh, and Tall Fifth, because it's the tallest thing on that side of Fifth Street. The Fifth Street terminates right there. Uh, and then, yeah, at its southern foot, we, uh, we covered that. I really don't need to go over that. I mean, to me, the... Uh, the cast location, I mean, it makes sense. And, and again, yeah, it's a random location. But all of these locations in these other parks are completely random, too. You're telling me that, you know, uh, in Chicago it was at a fence post. And in Boston it was uh, by home plate. And in Cleveland it was in a planter. You're telling me these aren't random locations. You know, it, if, it, if it serves what he's trying to accomplish with the puzzle, it doesn't matter how random the location is because they're all pretty random. So let's look at the objects in the rebus one more time, uh, as there's a couple more interesting details here. Notice how the items are paired together by color. You have the two red balls, the key and the walking stick are darker, and the flower and the millstone are, are lighter tones. Uh, and it just so happens that these objects are all paired together in art interpretation as well. What they're uh, representing are things that are paired together. The two red balls represent the boxing club. The key and the walking stick represent two streets that make up our staircase. And the flower and the millstone represent our two cultures and are visible from the cask location. Now the flower is used to reference the window design on St. Stephen's, which is our proud tall fifth. Uh, there are three details here which gives us further confirmation of this. So first, counting the objects uh, of the rebus from left to right, the flower is the fifth object. Uh, secondly, if you count the petals on the flower, there are five petals. And then look just below the flower and zoom in real close. Now, I told you guys not to take anything for granted. Uh, and recently, I noticed this dark spot and wondered what it was. Now, a, a word of caution. I've noticed that on different devices, you get different effects here. Sometimes it looks like uh, just a blob, and other times you can get a really clear look at what this is. There is a five right below the flower. So there you have further confirmation that St. Stephen's is the proud tall fifth. So the, the last thing I want to point out is 
most times people are ignoring the juggling symbolism in the painting. So she is clearly juggling objects. What does that mean? In our solution, you start on 4th Street and you end at 4th Street. So in juggling, you know, when you're just juggling in a circle, the end is the beginning. So it, it makes perfect sense that you would start on 4th Street and you would end on 4th Street. Then let's look here and, and, and look at the rebus too. Somebody else actually uh, pointed out that you're supposed to read the rebus both ways. It makes perfect sense because another form of juggling is where you're, you're tossing back and forth between both your hands. So if we read it from right to left, it says Milwaukee, but you read it from left to right, it takes you to the treasure. It is designed to be read both ways. It has significance being read both ways. And then you think about, think about the, the first building you see and the last building you see. So we got the Kunzelman Esser Furniture Building, that's our three stories of Mitchell. And then you have uh, St. Stephen's, which is your proud tall fifth. Compare those two buildings together. That's your beginning and your end. So if this is representing juggling symbolism and the end is the beginning, there should be some similarities between those two. And there are. A, they're the same color schemes. Because Kunzelman Esser is a white building with red letters, and St. Stephen's is a red building with white trim. Uh, also, uh, they are both described by the streets that they're on. Uh, you got Mitchell Street and you got Fifth Street. They are both described using numbers. You got three and five. And then they are also described by how tall they are. View the three stories of Mitchell, proud, tall, fifth. That's a lot of connections. They're connecting those two things together. Now, I teased at the beginning of the video that I had a new piece of evidence, and Lisa's, Lisa's smiling right now. So for a while, I was thinking about the L in the woman's cloak and how the, the lines reminded me of like lanes on a highway. And, you know, I mean, and that would just be just a really generic uh, connection. I mean, you can't really, you know, prove that. They're just lines. So, I mean, that could be anything. But then I was thinking about, okay, so the key and the walking stick, they're at specific angles for specific reasons. And this L, you know, it's really strange how the vertical member of the L bends the way that it does. So why would that be? So if you superimpose the L, on Google Maps over Greenfield Avenue and the highway, right at that point of the highway, it curves northwest exactly at the same angle that the L does. Between the highway and Greenfield Avenue, it is creating the same L that we are showing, that, uh, that's being shown in the painting, and that just happens to be right where the cask location is. So what is representing your starting point is also representing your ending point. It is perfectly uh, fulfilling the juggling symbolism. Again, it's like the, the, the fourth example of it. So if you guys are convinced after all that, there is nothing I can say that's going to change your mind. But I don't see how anybody can deny this. And I hope this was a better explanation of things. I, I, I hope you guys saw what I was trying to convey to you. Because I really need a community of people to get behind this and help me. I am not going to be able to do anything else on an individual level. But I desperately want this to be uncovered. One way or the other. And we should not be going there and digging illegally. Please, nobody do that. You know, because I don't know what the consequences are going to be. Look, you know, everyone keeps saying, well, why don't you just go dig it up? First of all, you know, it's, it's uh, against my morals to go do that because that land doesn't belong to me. And I want to be able to teach my kids to respect other people's property. So I'm not going to go do that. And because you have to be a, an approved contractor with a permit to dig over there, when all of this becomes public and they know exactly what you did and exactly who you are, what are they going to find you? Like, I have no idea. But if we have a, a large group of people that get behind this and actually act on this, we might be able to get this done in a reasonable, legal way. You know, if you guys, hey, I mean, email Josh Gates, uh, call news stations, pester, pester the county, 
please. I, and I would love it if you would do it on my behalf, but if we can come together as a community, we will have a lot more power to actually see this thing uh, resolved and solved. I would like resolution for the priest family. You know, this would be one more chapter closed in, in that story, and I would love for that to happen. And so far, what I'm doing here isn't enough. So I'm hoping this information is enough to compel you and to motivate you to help me get this done. We can get this done. Thank you very much for viewing. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give me a like. Please feel free to leave comments. I wish more people would, would challenge me on this and would ask me questions. I am open and available for, for any questions, any challenges, and, and I am more than willing to you know, polite, politely but passionately defend this solution. Thank you for watching. Hey guys, I just wanted to make a uh, quick update. You know, it's pretty amazing. I've been doing this for uh, about a year now, and every time I think I've found everything I'm going to find, I find more evidence. So I have a few uh, quick things that I want to share with you here. Uh, if you look at the, let's start with the painting. Look at the painting. Uh, look at the walking stick. I can't believe that I didn't notice this before. So you look at the, the handle of the walking stick is pointing at the jewel. And the cask location is in Walker's Point. I don't know how much more obvious that could be. That's a really good piece of evidence. And then I wanted to quickly talk about City Hall. Because I keep going back and forth on City Hall and what that actually is. Uh, I, I honest, honestly believe at this point that the City Hall image is actually uh, City Hall. You know, if you were to look at the painting and compare it to a silhouette of actual City Hall... It matches awful close. I mean, even down to uh, minute details. But then we have to ask ourselves, okay, why is it obscured? That's really the big question, because if this is City Hall, okay, somebody that doesn't know this is City Hall isn't going to know it's City Hall either way, whether it's obscured or not. And somebody that does know it's City Hall is going to know it's City Hall either way, whether it's obscured or not. So then what is the purpose of obscuring this? And I, I think what it's, it's trying to convey is... City Hall uh, inspired the architecture of a lot of buildings in the Milwaukee area, including you know some of the churches uh, on, on our path. If you look at St. Stephen's, like I talked about, and if you look at uh, St. Stanislaus, there are a lot of uh, similarities to that. And the other days, because I, I, I had a theory, and I just kind of want to show you guys what my frame of mind was and why I thought this might be something other than City Hall. So the other day I went down to Mitchell Street, and I took a picture of the backside of St. Stanislaus. And, I, you know, I thought maybe if you got the right angle or maybe if there was another building superimposed over it that you might get a very similar uh, image to City Hall. And I got kind of close. I didn't get close enough to convince myself that that's what it was. So if you look at this picture of St. Stanislaus, you can see a lot of the similarities between it and City Hall. We got the two towers. You know, you have a slightly different design uh, between the primary tower versus the secondary tower. Uh, you have this you know, angled roof line here. Uh, even there's a little architectural feature there uh, on the uh, the City Hall image that kind of matches the location where the spire is. So you imagine the spire sticking up. So that, that's at least what, what I saw and why I believed it was possible this could be something else. Again, I think this is phys physically City Hall, but I think it's obscured in order to make us think about the other buildings uh, that share uh, very similar architecture to it. And then, you know, just doing a very minor research on City Hall, I discovered that City Hall is based on German architecture. So this is an example of, of German culture in Milwaukee. And given that the woman is, you know, in the shadow of it, again, makes perfect sense to everything we talked about in terms of the, of the, the symbolism that's being created. The last thing I have to talk about is actually something that my wife discovered. She's very proud of this, and, and she should be. So if you look at the map, uh, just south of downtown and west of the lake, and you look at the river there, look at the river. That is the face of the woman in the painting. You follow it down. You, you see the, the forehead, the eye socket, the nose, the, uh, the little... Uh, cleft in the chin, even the part in her hair is all emulated by the by the river.
do you guys really still think this is a lion statue? I mean, good grief. This, and when you look at the area uh, that you're in, it's, it's in the area of the treasure hunt. It's in the area that we've highlighted. So it's, it's exactly where it should be. And I'm not going to get too deep into this, but I've noticed with this puzzle, there's lots of dualities. You know, you have two cultures. You have, you know, uh, two meanings for the L and the cloak. You have two meanings for the, uh, for the face of the woman. There's so many things that appear in twos. It's very interesting, and I think I might cover that in a uh, future video. But for now, guys, thank you for watching. Please leave a like. Give me some love. I need some love. I've been getting kind of uh, hammered on the, uh, in the messages here. So, please, I need your support. I need you guys to help organize and help me get this done. I want to get this done, but as I've mentioned at length, I refuse to do this the wrong way. We can make this happen. I just desperately need your help, and I need you guys to look at this critically and see that this is correct. Thank you for watching.